AI experience and fine tuning and using this uh, mock security call set for a large number of customers that we have and you know, thousands of uh, servers that we have installed on. So some of the goals here today are uh, to understand mock security, you know, what that means, but also to set the right expectations uh, when you're using or before you start using mock security. Because setting the right expectations is the key in getting a successful result. Right, and we, we're going to share our experience about tuning, tuning, and continuous tuning, and how to pay for your uh, mock security, and especially the call reset. And this is a talk by the practitioners or the professional, and the curious, you know, who uh, are thinking about using mock security or just want to learn more about mock security. So this is a bit of an agenda, you know, this is, um, and we talk about web in general, and we're going to talk about more about more security and how you get ready, you know, both mentally and technically for more security. And then talk about phone set, fine tuning, and you know what's new with the uh, new release uh, 3.0 and currently 3.02. So before we dive into this um, nitty-gritty details about more security, a little, a little bit about our network and where we work, because that kind of comes into context of what we are discussing and how we are approaching this problem. So uh, Verizon got into this content delivery network business through the acquisition of this uh, company called Edgecast. So we were formerly known as Edgecast and now we are part of Verizon family. And we have you know, thousands of servers installed around the world at about 100 plus locations and more security is running on all of them. Right, so that's the first line of defense that way your HTTP or HTTPS configuration terminates and when we get to see the HTTP traffic and when we get to inspect good, bad, and the suspicious stuff that comes on the HTTPS or HTTP. We do have a large number of customers that, and some of them are what we call the fully managed customers in that my team work with them to manage their security portion through our web settings and also other security settings. So getting into a little bit about, you know, what is WAN, right? Because uh, when you go talk to different uh, vendors, they might have different definitions. Probably the authoritative document on you know, what WAN is and how to evaluate WAN is an OWASP document called the WAN Evaluation Criteria or WAPAC. That's still version 1.0, but uh, it is in need of being updated. 2.0 is in progress. But these are the characteristics of um, what a WAN is. Right, so, so it operates with an HTTP layer, and as such, you know, it can see the HTTP uh, transactions, both the request and the response, all the headers and content and posts and so on. Um, and the main goal of this is to address, you know, application level security issues like the, those defined in OWASP content, like SQL injection or cost and scripting or, you know, uh, information disclosure, remote file access and things like that. But it can also operate on the network level information like uh, network subnets, you know, um, or even like the geo IP locations and so on. So why do you use web? Right, well, uh, obvious reason is to detect threats or then, you know, look for the suspicious traffic. That's what we call the detection. And once you can detect, you know, what's, what's bad or what's suspicious, you can take action and there could be a ton of mitigation and then, you know, you could be blocking that that traffic or you could be uh, just monitoring it until it gets worse or you know you could, you could be taking the downstream actions needed as uh, depending on what the uh, uh, what an attack is. It's also good for virtual patching in that you know uh, there's some framework breakage that you have heard about in the news and you know you don't have time or you know you don't have enough time to uh, actually deploy that update because it's going to take like you know weeks to rebuild the code, go through the QA, make sure there are no side effects that you don't like. So uh, by using web, you know you can specifically block that vulnerability from being exploited. And also, uh, last but not least, a policy enforcement. And by that I mean like a tech service reduction. Like you know you can um, see like you know I only speak HTTP 2.0. Anyone trying to speak HTTP? One or 1.1, 1 .1, you know, I, I don't want to talk to them. Or I only support certain HTTP verbs like you know, get and post and so on. I don't want to support you know option because there's probably with option lead. Or you know because you know I don't want to support prop file because people can't scan for uh, stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And 
It can be minimally effective in dealing with what we call the uh, automated threat, like these are the web bots that are doing, you know, legitimate but um, things that negatively impact you on your website. So a little bit about uh, bot security and its brief history. It was started back in 2002 by this um, uh, gentleman named uh, Ivan Gustav. You guys probably are familiar with it. He has moved on to do more things related to SSL, like SSL laptop <coughs> and so on. And it was started as a mod for Apache, but it later became uh, ported to Windows, IIS, and Nginx. Um, it uses a language called the set rules in defining tools. And you can also use um, uh, Lua to uh, write tools, but set rules is like that, you know, the first language that uh, it supports in uh, writing these two uh, rules, which later became just like a core rule set. And it's modular, and core rule sets up as a standard and default um, web rules for uh, more security. So more security, uh, when you say more security, there are actually two parts, two components, uh, two, you know, two sets of bits uh, that you need to uh, uh, install and uh, have it running. One is the engine, and engine is a separate OWASP project, and there's uh, then the core rule set. Right, so the engine, the latest release stable version of engine is 2.92, and 3.0 engine is in a, in like an alpha or beta kind of state right now. Uh, we have experts in the area who want to talk about that. Uh, and there is Core Reset, and Core Reset 3.0 came out late last year, and you know they have done the bug fixes and optimization, so we, we are at now 3.02, right? And that's and they two work together, but you don't need 3.0 engine to for 3.0 rules have to work, and there, there's some compatibility in between them. So 2.92 works definitely support 3.0 rule set. And there are two deployment modes. You can deploy it as part of your web server, so you can install the mod on your Apache or IIS or um, Nginx. Or you can use it as a reverse proxy, and then you, know, you can load it onto your load balancer, SSL Terminator, or in our case, you know, we loaded this onto our CDN as a, like a first point of contact. The browser or the end device and the, the other end of the HTTP connection. There are some principles in coming up with this uh, when they started designing more security. And one is to be flexible. Right? So more security by itself doesn't even include any rules. This core rule set is a separate project that you know to give you like a default and a standard set of rules. Right, so you can write all your all the rules you want on your own if you choose to, but all those rules that get you started. The other principle of this is a passiveness. What that means is that you know it it doesn't take any action unless you explicitly tell more security to do that. And the reason is that it doesn't want to interfere with the behavior on your one, one application. And last but probably the most important one is the predictability. Right, more security, and especially the rules that you write or rules from the core set, they are predictable in a way that they do what you tell them to do, they do what the regex is written to do, and there's no surprise in that, you know, it doesn't go to the cloud and check something, and the behavior changes over time because of this and that. So you, you don't get into that kind of uh, predictable behavior. So this is, um, in my view, you know, it, it is a great thing that you know what's exactly as you intended to make it work. And how many uh, other pieces of software you can say about that. Um, so these are the capabilities, these are the use cases, if you will, of how to use more security. You know, monitoring, obviously, but you can also use it for the like, HTTP, for HTTP logging. Because you know you can see through all the uh, entire transaction request and response. It can be used or even in some cases abused as a way to log a lot of uh, HTTP content what, because you know your web server logs are not going to be uh, enough to give you that you know, all the information you want. And of course, you know, attack detection and mitigation, that's a standard use case for web. But your patching, we talked about it earlier, you know, um, advising time. Uh, and but a few, a couple of other things that you can also use more security for is access control through uh, certain URL being blocked or certain extensions being blocked. And the reason is that you know you may have like sometimes like an intentional exposure of like some URL that you that shouldn't be there in the first place, some data that shouldn't be there, and you can use more security to block that URL or block. Or you know you can block some IP or something, or I think with 3.0 it has some support for the GOIP location pairing and so on. The other way we use this is to get the benefit of a tech service reduction and 
that's through restricting, you know, HTTP bugs that you want to support, and also about like um, setting that you don't limit on the you know, maximum file that you can upload, or the maximum number of arguments, or maximum size of each argument, and so on. So bot security is great, but it has some cost. I mean, software is free, commerce set is free, then your time is not free, but also you know, it has some components uh, uh, that you can uh, that can come on the uh, server that it is running. Um, so you, you should understand some of these, right? So if you're doing something like the file scans, like virus scans, more security support it, but it uses you know a virus scan engine, or you know if you're calling out to an external, uh, making something like an external blocking call. Some rules are more noisy than others, and depending on how you set up the logging, it can you can uh, you know, it can cost you in terms of like CPU time and disk storage and so on. Second thing to consider, I mean, using any web, especially with more security, is to uh, minimize the false positives false because they can you know impact on your performance. So the holy grail of this is like you know you want this to uh, you want your more security set up to scale linearly. What I mean is that as you have more transactions, more HTTP transactions, the cost on each transaction should be fixed. You should add more resources as your transactions grow and maybe shrink back as you uh, your transaction load uh, gets less. And you can do that through like you know. Um, some deployment mechanism, elastic scaling, or you know, you can use some mechanism like a CDN to dynamically grow and shrink your uh, uh, your server pool. But you know, the, the goal is that you know, the penalty that you pay for using more security shouldn't be fixed per transaction. And more security itself does pretty well depending on you know how you use it. And this graph is from this uh, more security handbook uh, written by Christian Polini, uh, and it just came out. Like, uh, Months ago, um, depending on how you tune it, you know, uh, CRS 3.0 has the uh, paranoia level, so the performance it, it is pretty good. But at some point, you, know, you start hitting uh, some of the performance uh, issues. So you need to keep in mind of that. But here, uh, also there are some limitations. That's you know, not just for security, but for web in general, right? There's not a fix-it-all solution. So if anybody tells you that. This solution is going to fix all your ills about software security. That's not true. Uh, you know, more security is the first line of defense. It'll do what it's designed to do, but it's not going to cure all your ills. It's not also set in a forget it type of solution. It does need you know continuous uh, care and maintenance, and it doesn't definitely replace other types of security mechanisms and controls that you have in your SDLC, like uh, you know uh, web modeling. Uh, Security testing, uh, source code scanning, and so on. Right, and it's not risk-free. Whenever you use a signature base or you know, any security control, there is a uh, balance between false positives and false negatives. And what side you're going to err on is highly dependent on your organization's or uh, your taste for risk. And it's not free even with the open source. The code is free, but you know uh, your time is not free and hard work. But this is uh, a graph, uh, a slide that I kind of picked up from David Casey, uh, his presentation about a year ago, and WAPs now have become a standard part of secure web deployment uh, mechanisms. Right, so that's a change in thinking that, you know, when, well, go back like 10 years ago, OWASP community thinks like, oh, you know, we, if we do all the secure SDLC right, we don't need WAP. From then that we shifted into like, oh, you know, uh, Web is not bad, it buys you time because you know when there's like a framework breakage, you know, it it's gonna take days to update the signature in web, but it's, it's gonna take weeks to release a new uh, software. From that to today's thinking, you know, which I agree with, is that you know, even if your software is perfect and you don't have that framework breakage today, there's still gonna be people who are attacking you just because they don't like you or whatever reason, or because you know you are on the internet. And web is great at dealing with and want to traffic away from you. So before you get started with web, you know, uh, I didn't pick these out of like uh, Auto World or Fortune Cookies, although I can submit them <laughs> to Fortune Cookies. 
Everybody knows, know yourself, know your adversary, and know your environment. Knowing yourself means that you know how uh, your risk level, right? Uh, so, in our experience, you know, dealing with some publishers, um, for them, having their website up and running is more important. And even if you have to block some of the users and some of them could be legitimate, um, it's okay as long as you know their website is up and running. Right? And that's very different from e-commerce that you know they want performance, but they also don't want any false positives. So you know they, they don't want to block it, any you know legitimate users, even you know, uh, if it is just a tiny bit because it has direct impact on their bottom line. And the banks may have a different thing concern about like, oh, I'm more concerned about you know credit card like data or security, uh, social security like data leaving the system, so they may be more concerned about inspecting the uh, HTTP. How much is your downtime worth, right? Uh, some companies, the downtime is worth literally like a million dollars an hour. And for some, you know, it may be just okay tolerable, right? Um, and you have PCI compliance or any other compliance requirement, but most importantly, you know, what's your security posture and what side you're gonna are on? You're gonna be tighter and risk, you know, some false positive, or you're gonna be a little looser and not lose any uh, profit and hands up and also, we ask these kind of questions like, you know, what are the security incidents or the more likely the attacks that you have received in the past? Because, you know, that kind of helps us get to um, tuning, uh, setting up these um, configurations that will suit your situation. And your environment is very important, especially, you know, why do you configure and uh, continuously manage this? Having access to the developers and software architect, you know, how your software is set up, you know, what are the uh, cookies that you use usually, or you know, what are the um, maximum sizes of your know, security uh, parameters and file size and things like that, or you know, do you really need options? Do you need uh, delete your know, HTTP verbs? So uh, that is very. Um, and how do you want to block it? Right? You want to block it with 403, or you want to redirect it to a pretty page? or you want to redirect to a pretty page with you know, some ID that the customer can call in and complain if they think it's a false positive. But last but not least, you know, this is uh, from our experience. You know, uh, people don't always, even after people deploy or people pay for web, you know, sometimes they abandon it. And the number one reason they abandon it is because, you know, especially with more security, oh, there's so many of us, I don't know what to do with it. Right? So it can be frustrating and it kind of breaks my heart because uh, now that you know we, we have this product running and you know we're getting paid but the customer is not getting benefit out of it. Right? So fine-tuning can be difficult and you know separating uh, signal from noise is expensive and you know out of the box settings really ever works, so you're gonna need to uh, continuously manage it. And with that, I'm gonna hand this over to Robert and all right, thank you guys. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the core rule set. Uh, so as Tin was referring to earlier, this is basically a rule set that you plug into the mod security engine. It's the most commonly used one. Uh, and it's a self-service rule set. And what I mean with that is uh, I've seen quite a few WAFs in my years. And uh, one thing that always bothered me the most was if you're just given a few simple checkboxes that basically let you have these, these very grand things of like, okay, here's, here's a checkbox for SQL injection attacks. Versus here with, a, with, with the entire rule set being at your beckoning basically, you can turn on individual rules and you can have thousands of rules but you have the, granul the granularity to be able to turn those rules on and off. Versus just basically a category that you may turn on or off on some commercial WAFs that you guys have maybe seen in the past. Uh, it targets the OWASP top 10 obviously, uh, so those, there's no reason to cover what those are, but those are your cross-site scripting attacks, your SQL injection attacks, your remote file inclusions, path, path traversal, things like that. Uh, it's a regex-based rule set, which is really nice, because once I get to the, to the ex exclusions, part, uh, exclusions part, you'll see too that uh, a lot of times it's easier to exclude something if you have the ability to exclude it via regex as opposed to you know strings or whatnot. So, um, 
it's the most commonly de deployed rule set for mod security, like I was saying, and it can go hand in hand with some commercial rule sets. So there's TrustWave rule sets and things like that that are also there for mod security, but we're gonna focus on the core rule set. It does allow for, li for pretty lightweight inspection, like Tim was referring to earlier. Uh, so the, the performance impact is not as great as maybe you would think, which is great. Uh, of course, again, if you're, if you're scanning larger files and things like that being uploaded, you are gonna see a bigger uh, per, uh, per, uh, performance impact. So now, to give you an idea kind of of, this is one of the accounts that I worked on over the last year. Uh, you can't see the numbers quite probably, but uh, it's, we started out at 45 million alerts per month. And that's basically turning the rules on, put it in alert mode, and then you are, you are assaulted with all of these alerts. And my job, my day-to-day -day job, is to make that curve go down to where it finally plateaus, and you'll see we're only down to a few thousand alerts a month, which should be actual attacks, right? So uh, this is kind of like music to my ears because it's nice to s see this curve. And I just want to put the emphasis on it because so many people will, that I will run into with our, our customers that will turn on the WAF and they get so overwhelmed immediately, which is totally understandable. I wouldn't want to stare at 45 million, or yeah, 45 million alerts every month either. So uh, as far as fine tuning goes, there's a, a, a specific approach that we take. We have the ability to run profiles concurrently. So what we do is you can run it in alert only mode basically and collect that data. This could be over the course of a week, Maybe if you are e-commerce, maybe you wanna run it over the course of a special sale that you're running. Uh, so it kind of depends on what your environment is to see how, long you, how much data you wanna gather in alert-only mode. Uh, and once you have enough data, you can start making decisions on what is a false positive and what is an actual attack. Now, uh, there's a little bit of knowledge required, obviously, here, where you can, are able to identify what is good and what is bad. Uh, but for the most part, what's important is to correlate all of those fields of the data that we've collected to kind of make that decision for you. The WAF cannot make the perfect decision for you. It's, 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 it, it needs your guidance, basically. So once we've decided what a false positive is, we can start excluding things. Now, uh, one thing about mod security that I think is great uh, is the, the an anomaly scoring threshold. And basically, it starts at one and goes as far as you want. And what it is basically is it's a threshold that needs to be met for the WAF to consider a request malicious. So if the threshold is lower, it will take less for the WAF to deem something malicious as opposed to when, let's say, my threshold is set at 20, for instance, and I'll show some examples in a minute, uh, then it would take far more rules to be able to trigger that WAF and then deem the alert malicious. So here's an example. Um, if you can see here, the first request is uh, our blocking profile, which is, uh, uh, which is basically the one that we are, that is in production, the one that we wanna be really careful with, because uh, and especially with my day-to-day, -day, my job is to keep the website secure, but definitely not to take it down, right? So um, usually your blocking mode is always gonna have a higher anomaly threshold than your alerting mode. And as you can see here, in the first example, we have our blocking threshold set at 15. After the first rule fires, we're at a three. After the second rule fires, we're at a six. After the third, we're at 11. So we're still under 15. So far, the request is still good. Then once we hit that last rule, we're taken up to 21, which is over, over 15, and now the WAF has deemed this alert malicious. Same thing with the alert only mode with the second request. As you can see, first, first request, same thing, hits three. Second rule fires, hits six. Third rule fires, hit 11, but our threshold is only 10. So now we are firing on one rule earlier than we are on our blocking profile. So uh, there's, Something uh, that's pretty important about excluding things, and here's the danger of having a self-service rule set as well, is a lot of times users will see that, okay, 981172 or whatever the rule, rule ID may be is firing a ton of false positives, and their first reaction is, well, we have, you know, we have hundreds of rules, let's just turn this one off. But then you're turning that rule off for your entire website. 
and there's no real need to do that. Uh, the, the, the thing that we always try to do is to keep as many rules active as possible. And turning a rule off is basically a no-no in my book. Usually, you can usually get around it in some way, shape, or form. So that involves you know, going, getting intimate with those WAF alerts and kind of understanding where they're coming from. This is where it helps a lot. If you, have, if you work very closely with actual developers on the app that may know how, how the app works, how it's supposed to behave, what's going to break, things like that. So making safe exclusions. So uh, one thing that people will also do, which is, a, which is another mistake, is to blanket whitelist URLs and say, OK, I see in this specific path, I'm basically getting a false positive. So why not go ahead and just whitelist that URL? Well, if you go that approach, you're technically whitelisting entire apps, and then your WAF isn't really doing much for you in the first place. So consider those very carefully. Uh, there are going to be situations where you may have to have a, a URL exclusion, but it's always safer to see what else we can do first. So, and um, a lot of this is taken care of with the, uh, with the anomaly scoring threshold, like I was referring to. So feel free to use that to use that threshold to kind of get to a baseline where you feel like you have enough false positives to be able to work on, enough data to work on, but also that you're not completely overwhelmed. And paranoia mode with CRS 3.0 makes that even better, and I'll get to that in a minute. So a uh, simple exclusion example, this is very distilled down. Obviously, this, in live production, this would look a little bit more, little bit more complicated. But basically, uh, what mod security allows you to do is to per perform a rule target update. Now, what that means is I'm basically saying if this argument is a false positive, in this case, email, do not inspect this argument for this specific rule. So if I see that an argument has a problem with a specific rule ID, I will target that rule ID in just one update to basically say exclude this argument from this rule. So that's great because that now not only did we, did we not have to, have to whitelist any URLs or the path itself, now we've been able to just whitelist the argument. We don't have to turn the rule off. The rule continues to be on. And, uh, and you can do this for arguments, argument names, and as well, cookies. Cookies, uh, cookies can, are a big problem for anyone that's ever worked with a WAF. Cookies get flagged constantly. Uh, there, you have to take a bit care with uh, whitelisting those as well, only because uh, there are situations where a cookie could be manipulated in, in a bad way. However, um, in the day-to-day -day attacks that you see, that would be a quite, a, quite a bit of a targeted attack. So, uh, And with cookies, I found a lot of times cookies will flag all across the website. So sometimes it does bode well to basically globally exclude a cookie. But we still take the approach of basically taking it one rule at a time. Because again, we don't want to turn rules off. We don't want to whitelist anything that we don't necessarily need to. On to CRS 3.0. I put this in because it has a movie poster and a mod security rule set with a movie poster is good in my books. Uh, it's the first major CRS release uh, since 229, which was in 2013. Uh, and it includes the paranoia mode, which I will detail more in a second. And lots of uh, what, what we'll call problem rules have been identified and removed. Some, some, some of them have been combined with others. Uh, it's a much more concise rule set than it was before, and it's a lot easier to maintain as well. And, uh, and the false positive rate is, is much, 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 much lower in 3.0 than it was with uh, 229. So uh, CRS 3.0 uh, has a few things to highlight. A lot of re remote code execution rules have been added. Uh, and a lot of the SQL injection and cross-site scripting rules have also been uh, uh, joined into the uh, lib injection li library, which was, which was added with 3.0. Uh, and there's lots of great documentation, too. Uh, I, I think uh, mod security can be a little bit daunting sometimes, especially if you're getting started out on it. Uh, but there's great documentation recently. And like Tin had mentioned, uh, Christian uh, Fellini's book that just came out a few months ago is fantastic. Uh, so there's lots of great stuff for you to kind of study up and learn with this stuff. Paranoia mode is basically, uh, it was built on the back of anomaly scoring mode. And 
if you can remember what I was referring to, the anomaly scoring mode of having one to a larger integer depending on how large the attack is, parano paranoia mode is a bit simpler. It's just basically, if you can imagine a slider from one to four, one being the least sensitive and four being the most sensitive. So if you would set up mod security 302 out of a box, you would basically start it out at par paranoia level one. You get about 150 rules, very few false positives. So this is what I would suggest you run first. And then if you feel that you're comfortable with the false positive rate and, and you make sure that you're not breaking anything, you can move on to paranoia level two, which gives you 30 additional rules but now you're definitely gonna start seeing some false positives and some of that elbow grease that we refer to with fine tuning is still going to be required. And then uh, level three gives you 15 more rules and now we're definitely getting to it to where you need to start being careful before you turn those on into a, a blocking mode first. And then by the time you get to paranoia level four, you would hope that your, your WAF is already basically fine tuned. And, um, uh, and if it's not fine-tuned by the time that you hit four, then probably you're going to run into some trouble. So. Alrighty, and uh, that is basically it. Uh, um, any questions? Hi. Yep. Is this on? Yep. Hello. Yes. There you go. Um, so first of all, I, I deeply admire your courage, because there are not too many people nowadays who are willing to come out and talk about WAF. They kind of fell out of fashion a few years ago, and, and so that is, that is great. Um, the tough question I have to ask is, given the amount of time you spent working on web application firewalls, uh, would you recommend uh, to a security team to invest in web applications firewall knowing that they're essentially going to be spending probably one or two full-time employees on them or should they direct their resources to fixing the applications directly what is your take on that uh first my take would be and uh it's i think that there's a world where both can coincide and i understand some organizations will have to make one decision or another Considering that WAF is your first line of defense, and even, even if you have it set to lower anomaly scoring thresholds or lower paranoia levels, I would still consider that to be better, especially with 302, it coming out of the box with paranoia level one, you already have 150 rules or so that you're basically working on. And I think that little bit, especially since it's open source and you can get it running, I think that's, that, is, that is essential, and I think WAF should be a part of your security practice in general. Uh, not, not to say that there's not a place you know, to fix your bugs and things like that, but I think they also go hand in hand. Uh, a lot of times we can provide feedback to our customers and say, we're flagging really hard on this, uh, you shouldn't be passing things this way, and, and it, it, it's, it's actually feedback we can provide to the web app developers as well, so. And also, uh, What are your thoughts on who manages the WAF? Um, have you seen any situations? So obviously security teams are typically strapped for resources and stuff like that. Is there, have you seen developers take this on at all in any of the, your interactions with various clients where they try to implement some sort of WAF on their IIS server or the like? Uh, for the most part, I, I'd say the, the stewards of WAFs with our customers are usually based in IT, but it, it's great when we have a security team on the other end. Uh, that's, that's usually our easiest customers, obviously. Uh, but then it usually comes down to, to I, IT folks, and then, and then we don't really mess with the developers too much on their end. Uh, but uh, we do interface with them in some cases, like, like I was saying, if we see that there's a problem or they're passing a crazy string in some argument that obviously is getting flagged that we're not gonna be able to do anything about, we provide that feedback to our customers so that they can provide the feedback back to the devs too, so. Um, so uh, one of the things that the WAV has to do is uh, if it detects anomaly, let's say in a parameter or something like that, 
uh, it has to log that parameter. Otherwise, you cannot really investigate that. So one of the problems I have seen with mod security and its rules are, uh, th there is a way in mod security to, um, to divert uh, these logs to a different log so that they don't mix with your normal Apache logs. However, the rules, each rule can be uh, done in a different way and sometimes um, they, they end up in all those places. Have you seen that? How, how, how have you tried to solve that? So uh, there's a few different levels of logging that mod security does provide. Uh, there's obviously, you know, a quote unquote a nine basically where it will basically log everything versus where it, it could be like, I think, I, 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 I think ours is set much lower than that because there's it's a lot of data that we're pulling in, a lot of WAF alerts. So uh, in that case, uh, cutting off and, and identifying what information you really need. Like maybe you don't need to log the, log the entire thing. Maybe I just need to know what rule did it fire on, where did it fire on, what was the refer, what was the user agent, and what was the actual matched value that it, that it, that it matched on in that specific rule, and then I would go from there. And also uh, purging your logs, obviously. Uh, we, have, we have certain time, time windows, both internally and externally for our customers, that we say this is kind of a cutoff date, since we can't keep those forever. <laughs>